catchy. I like it. River, how's the temperature? It's a refreshing 52 degrees, man. I love it. Uh, Turtle. He's not here yet, man. Uh, he's late every morning. Okay. Squirrel. The forest has been preparing just for you. To learn more about cool things to do in the forest, visit discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Did you know that Ring Central is the business phone system behind some of the fastest growing companies? Why Ring Central? Because it's a phone system in the cloud that easily grows with your company. Old phone systems are a mess of wires and cables. Adding an employee or office means figuring out that mess, which takes time a fast moving business doesn't have. Ring Central gives you a new, better way. Easily add employees and offices. Make any device act like a corporate phone, even your own cell phone. Visit ringcentral.com to see how. July 13th, 2016, the next line in the sand. Join Paul Jensen on Inside the News, May 16th, as he sits down with attorney Garrett Smith and attorney Glenn Wagstaff in studio to discuss the upcoming changes to gun trusts and how it will affect you. But more importantly, what you can do about it. Get Inside the News like you don't get anywhere else. With Paul Jensen, May 16th at 8 a.m. Gun Trusts, what you need to know before the deadline. Only on KTALK AM 630. Good morning. Welcome back to K Talk Inside the News. You're here with Paul Jensen, your host, and it's Alex Newman Hour. Glad to have you with us this morning, Alex, uh, here on K Talk. Glad to be here. Thanks very much, Paul. Alex is a uh, foreign correspondent for the New American Magazine, and he writes for other publications. He's an author, he's an educator, he's a speaker, and he's our co host on Thursday at 8 from 8 to 9 o'clock. You know, I read some of these stories with great interest uh, and uh, that, that you've written articles on here over the past week. And I think even a lot of our very uh, educated listeners would be surprised that the CIA has its genesis, or, I mean, excuse me, the European Union, the, the EU has its genesis, genesis with the CIA and its predecessor. Uh, that's a, an interesting story. We've talked a little bit about it here on the air. The, the fact that the United States CIA, the, a government agency, a security agency, a spy agency, if you will, and the OSS, its predecessor, were the foundation behind what is now the European Union. What is the story there? What's the, the history behind that, Alex? Sure. Well, basically, uh, after World War II, uh, globalists, and again, we're looking at the Council on Foreign Relations, um, they decided that the best way to pursue world government would be to merge the United States and Europe first as kind of the nucleus of a world federal government and, uh, and then add on nations from there to this uh, you know, growing crowd of, uh, of united nations in this federal system. But they had a problem, right? The Europeans didn't want anything to do with this. They were worried, and quite properly, that uh, you know, if their tiny little nation joined in a political federation with the United States, it would be swallowed up and would become completely irrelevant and would just be subjected to uh, basically foreign rule. And um, you know, there's, there's no theory about this. Uh, the, the documentation, the evidence is all throughout the congressional record. It's all throughout the declassified CIA documents and OSS documents. So there's really no controversy over this, except among people who haven't looked at the facts, at the documents, at the information in the congressional record. And this actually used to be very open. Uh, that's the amazing thing. Nowadays, you don't hear about it so much, although it was in the Telegraph recently uh, how the CIA really created the European Union. It was a CIA project, is how the gentleman in the Telegraph put it, Ambrose uh, uh, Pitchens, uh, I forget his last name, but uh, uh, one of the normal writers over there for the Telegraph, he called the European Union a CIA project, and he's right. Uh, the declassified documents show very clearly that the CIA controlled the entire European Federalist movement. They were funding it. Uh, they had special bank accounts where they were dropping money to these uh, leaders of this European Federalist movement and its youth wing. And again, the goal was quite simple. And, and, and it wasn't secret at the time what the CIA's operations were and the OSS operations were, but the U.S. government policy of trying to unify 
Europe into a single political and economic federation under a single federal government was not a secret. That there was legislation that was passed by Congress uh, in 1951, for example, they passed the Mutual Security Act, uh, part of the Marshall Plan, and they explicitly said that it was the goal of the United States, the policy of the United States, to unify Europe in a political federation. So again, this wasn't a secret. It, it is largely now because you don't learn about it in school. They don't talk about it on TV. They don't talk about it on the news. But, um, you know, back then this was out in the open. And we have a lot of quotes from straight from the congressional record about this in a book that I did with uh, Rick Biondi. And it's not even really a book so much as it is just a collection of primary source documents and quotes from the congressional record exposing what happened here. So basically they set out after World War II to unify Europe into a single political federation. Uh, when they realized that people wouldn't go for that, they started with the, with the deception. They said, oh, you know, this is just a free trade agreement. You know, nobody's going to lose any sovereignty here. Don't worry about it. You'll still keep your right to self-government. We're just going to have free trade here. And, uh, you know, using that lie, you know, it, up until uh, the 80s and 90s and even in the early 2000s, people who said this was the goal with the, the establishment of the media were saying, oh, these are just conspiracy theories and we would never do such a thing. And now they're shouting it from the rooftops, right? You have the so-called EU president talking about they're going to build an EU military and they're going to uh, create a federal government and everybody's going to have to submit whether they like it or not. So, you know, it's been a, a weird ride. But the ultimate goal remains to merge the United States and Europe. We have the TTIP for that, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is very similar to kind of NAFTA, the European Free Trade Agreements that were used to build the European Union. And the goal is to set up these transnational bureaucracies that will rule over the U.S. and the EU. Uh, and again, you know, we've talked about this on the show before. The ultimate goal is to build this that they call the New World Order, where you have all these regional governments just pledging their loyalty to the single global entity, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, and then tell me how Brexit, British exit, has anything to do with this, and why are they fighting so vehemently? Uh, they're putting on the full – here they've been doing this since the 1940s. Now, for the first time, there is a reversal, and it is being threatened uh, by people wanting their sovereignty, their nationality back. That's right. Well, the British are kind of waking up now, right? And they have been for several years now. If this vote had been taken uh, you know, in any of the last three or four years, it would have been overwhelmingly hands down for secession. But the establishment is really pulling out all stops here because – they realize that if Britain leaves the European Union, it might start a domino effect. Uh, you might have, you know, all kinds of European countries saying, hey, you know, the British can do it. Why can't we get out? And, you know, they don't like to talk about Switzerland, this, you know, little island of freedom and prosperity right in the middle of this monster called the European Union. And uh, so the British are saying, hey, you know, Switzerland doesn't have to be part of the EU, and they're super rich, and they're trading, and, uh, you know, they have their freedom. They get to vote on things. They get to choose their own leaders. They don't have to accept all this craziness coming out of Brussels. So why can't we do the same thing? And uh, the establishment is saying, no, you know, the world's going to end. There's going to be wars. There's going to be, uh, you know, all kinds of apocalyptic scenarios if the British leave. And I suspect the establishment will go to any length to try to stop this, right? And, and by that I mean even up to and including voter fraud if they think they can get away with it. I think they would very happily manipulate the votes if they thought they could get away with it. So I just, uh, you know, I hope, it's my personal hope, that the British will so overwhelmingly come out against this that nothing that the establishment does can, um, can you know, stop it. But Again, you know, they have the full weight of the establishment coming out here. You have the prime minister warning that wars are going to come. You have Obama flying over there and telling them that they better stay in the European Union if they want to be prosperous. Uh, you have uh, all the big bankers telling them, oh, you're going to lose all your money and you're going to be poor and there's not going to be any jobs and blah, blah, blah. And, of course, all of that is nonsense. But, uh, you know, it shows you how far they're willing to go to keep Britain in the European Union. And, you know, really people don't want to be in the European Union. If you look at the polls, even with all this propaganda, they're still, uh, you know, quite evenly split, assuming you can trust the polls. So, um, you know, it's an interesting development, and I think it's something that's worth watching because if the British do rise up and say, hey, enough of this, um, it would be, I think, a devastating blow to the globalists. I looked at the, I looked at the polls, and I looked at six, six different polls of people who are for or against Brexit for Great Britain exiting European Union, and they were so vastly different in their 
results that I knew that they were manipulated. Everything from the point that from from numbers 20 percent in favor of Brexit, of leaving the European Union, up to 24 percent in staying in. And so they manipulate them to make people think, oh, yeah, you know what, the majority of the people want us to stay in. But I think the more reliable polls are showing that the people who favor Brexit, favor the exit of Britain, uh, really more people want to get out than want to stay in. Don't you think that that's uh, factual? I think that's clear, yeah. You know, the credible poll. And, you know, the, the pollsters, uh, a lot of them are really, they should be called government propagandists, right? Their job okay. is to try to get the numbers that the government wants. And we see this all over the place. You know, if you look at uh, the global warming polls, they, they use such leading questions to try to get the responses that they want. So then they can put that in the headlines and say, see, most people agree with us. Uh, and then people have this kind of psychological need, want to kind of be with the herd, you know? So they, oh, well, most people support this. I guess I better support it, too. But, um, you know, I, I hope it won't work in this case. I, I do think that uh, the majority of the British people want to get out. Um, the credible polls that I have seen do seem to show that. And, uh, you know, and, and this is even after all the propaganda. And, and before, uh, you know, some years ago, it was overwhelming how many people wanted to get out before they really started ratcheting up the propaganda. So, uh, yeah, I, I think the polls are manipulated, and I think that's true all over the place all oh, the bet. time. Even you know, in if you the United States. <laughs> Exactly. Of course, yeah, especially yeah, in the United States. Uh, hey, uh, Alex, yep. we've got Tony who's been waiting online to ask a question, and, uh, and, and part of it is about uh, the, the United Nations. And after, Tony, after you finish your questions and comments, I'd like to hear about how the, the, the euro is involved in this and uh, what is the value of the euro and how did this play into, into creating this new uh, European-wide government? Go ahead, Tony. You're on the air with uh, Alex Newman. Hey, Alex. Um in the reading that I've done over time, I found during World War II they were referring to Allied forces as United Nations forces, and I wondered if you had heard that, uh, and if in your perspective it was laying the groundwork for pressing the establishment of the United Nations. Good question. And, you know, they did very often refer to the Allies as the United Nations, and, of course, the United Nations as an entity, that what we know today as the United Nations, did not yet exist. But uh, I have no doubt that that was kind of psychological preparation, right? You, you make people, you have a positive connotation with the term United Nations, right? The liberators who stopped the evil Nazis. Everybody loves the United Nations. And, uh, you know, after that, uh, one of the big wars that we fought uh, in Korea was, of course, fought under the banner of the actual United Nations, what we know today as the United Nations. Um, and, you know, supposedly fighting world communism, even while world communism clearly dominated the United Nations, right? You had the Soviet Union uh, and its member states all holding these uh, important positions and uh, its agents operating all the, you know, top positions. Even the American, uh, Alger Hiss, our chief negotiator, the guy who ended up serving as the first secretary general of the United Nations, was a Soviet agent. So the idea that we ought to fight wars under the banner of the United Nations is, of course, preposterous on its face, especially when the enemy is actually a member of the United Nations and a you know, key component of it. But that's what happened. And uh, I suspect that, uh, you know, as you suggested, uh, the reason that they uh, often refer to the Allies as the United Nations was a way to kind of warm people up to the idea and soften people up to the idea that we could be these United Nations and, you know, battle the forces of evil altogether. So... You know, I, I think there's uh, probably something there. Very good. Yes, good question, Tony. What, what else have you got? Well, I was wondering if uh, he would comment on Carol Frigley's poem, uh, Tragedy and Hope, as the communist opposition being a controlled front by uh, the extremely wealthy banking and commerce establishment. Yeah, and, you know, I think that's what international communism always has been and, and always will be. Uh, you know, that's not to say that uh, your average uh, communist useful idiot on the street has any inkling of that, right? They think they're fighting the capitalists and, and the bankers and so on. Well, all the while they're being used as puppets by these same super capitalists and super bankers. Um, but, you know, Carol Quigley was right in several respects in his book. You know, he talked about how the, the insiders actually operate a lot like the American right thinks the communists operate, right? And they have no aversion to working with them, uh, is how Carol Quigley put it. And he's exactly right. I mean, if you look, uh, you know, there's been some very important books on this subject. Uh, Anthony Sutton, for example, released uh, Wall Street and the Rise of the Soviet Union or the Bolsheviks. And, uh, you know, he explained in great detail 
how the Western establishment, the Western globalists, played such a key role in bringing the Bolsheviks to power. And, you know, we can you know, extend that down the line. Who put Chairman Mao in power? Well, the globalists, right? It, it was thanks to the work of the Council on Foreign Relations and our agents in the State Department and uh, the U.S. military that China, that you know, massive land, the most populated country in the world, fell to the communists. Okay, we've got some... Uh your line there, Tony, started to get uh, some sort of a, a noise on it. We're going to go to a break here in about uh, 10 or 20 seconds. Uh, Alex, uh, thanks for joining us this morning, Tony. I've got thanks the question uh, here still remaining. I want to know how the euro played into this, and the euro has not done as well as they sh certainly hoped. But didn't that have a, a foundation in forming this new government where the uh, United Nations was involved and where – the CIA was involved. Uh, we, we're not going to be able to have time to answer that uh, until after this uh, break, but we will be back in, in, a, in a few seconds, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, you're here with us on K Talk, 6.30 a.m. You've got Alex Newman on this morning with us again, like we do every Thursday. You can call us at 801-254-5855 with your questions or your comments. Thanks for joining us, Alex. We'll be right back. Motel 6 has the message our nation is seeking. Motel 6 is a great choice for travelers. With the highest standards. A clean, comfortable room with everything you need and nothing you don't. Fiscally responsible. Lowest price of any national chain. Dedicated. We'll leave the light on for you. Motel 6. Right on travel. Right for America. I'm Tom Bodette, and, um, yeah, I approve this message. Book online at motel6.com. With OnStar, you don't need to drive the newest model car to have the latest in connectivity. If you're not connected, now get select OnStar services free for three years with no strings attached. You'll get a mobile app that lets you start your car or unlock your doors from your phone and monthly diagnostic email reports. Just push the blue OnStar button and ask for three years of free mobile app and diagnostic services. Emergency and security services are not included. Eligible on select 2011 and newer vehicles. Visit OnStar.com for details, coverage map, and system limitations. Get set to save now at your local Kubota dealer. Kubota RTVX Series is the best-selling diesel utility vehicle in the industry, according to Power Products Marketing North American Utility Vehicle Market Reports, May 2014. Get long-term financing as low as 0% APR for four years on new Kubota RTVX utility vehicles. Now through June 30th, 2016. Call toll-free 1-888-465-8268 for details about costs and terms. Visit Sunset Kubota and Bonneville Equipment or find your local Kubota dealer online at utahkubotadealers.com. It's another Retirement Minute with Manny. What if what you knew about retirement was untrue? Would you want to find out today or find out when you retire? Whether you're 25 or 55, you'd want to know sooner rather than later. Let Manny Negron share five common mistakes people make before they hit retirement. To learn what they are, have a look at the complimentary Retirement Preparation Kit Manny shares with clients. It's full of insights, tips, and things you can do to help retire successfully someday. Every retirement needs a roadmap. Start your journey with this retirement preparation kit, and to get your kit, just visit retirewithmanny.com. Again, to get your kit, your retirement preparation kit, just visit retirewithmanny.com. Gen Wealth Advisory Group is an independent financial services firm helping individuals create retirement strategies using a variety of investment and insurance products to custom suit their needs and objectives. The following is a message from the Bud Light Party. Today, we're grabbing a few Bud Lights to talk about the serious issues, like renewable energy. There's solar, there's wind. What other weather can we put to work for Americans? How about rain energy? Can we harness the power of fog or thunder snow? That's a real thing. What if thunder snow energy could charge our cell phones? Figure it out, science. This message approved by the Bud Light Party. Raise one to right now. Enjoy responsibly. Bud Light Beer, AB, St. Louis, Missouri. Oh, I'm ready. Ready I'm Beth. I'm a service rep for Cintas, and I help businesses get ready. Ready for the unpredictable workday, bad weather, a sudden fire, or a rush of customers. Cintas is your source for fresh mats, crisp uniforms, cleaning programs, safety solutions, and fire protection. Will you be ready today? Get started at Cintas.com. Cintas, ready for the workday. I'm ready for
Folks, welcome back to K-Talk. 6.30 on your AM dial, also streaming from k-talk.com. You can listen live on the website. You can download the app. There's several apps you can download. The one that's my favorite is TuneIn and listen wherever you are. Uh, We've got Mr. Alex Newman on. We call it the Alex Newman Hour every Thursday morning from 8 to 9 a.m. We're loaded for bear this morning. We're talking about the European Union and the fact that it had its genesis, its creation, its backing by the OSS and then later by that predecessor, the CIA. Uh, And uh, a real agenda, a real recipe for New World Order, which began began clear back in the 40s, I guess, Alex. Uh, but uh, along the way, they decided to create a, a currency to be the foundation or the financial arm of this European Union called the euro. How, what is the history behind that, and, and how strong is the euro, and, and was it a good idea? Well, the euro, like uh, the European Union itself, again, had its uh, genesis with these globalists. They wanted to unify the European countries in such a way that it would be almost impossible for them to get out. And, uh, you know, we, we see now that that plan was fairly successful. You know, Greece, for example, has been really suffering. I mean, suffering incredibly, I think, in a way that Americans today can't really understand. You know, shortages of medicine, shortages of all kinds of things, unemployment in 20, 30 percent, sometimes even higher, depending on what group you're looking at. And, uh, you know, still, despite all of that, and, and, and a great deal of that was caused by the euro, and of course a great deal was also caused by the huge government they had. You know, they kept electing uh, big government mongers in the office. But the combination of those two things, if they had left the euro, their debts would have been manageable, uh, and, you know, they could have gotten their country back on the right track. But the insiders were so determined to keep them in, and they were in this kind of prison that was created by the euro. And, uh, you know, if you look back at the early documents of uh, the people who were behind this European Union movement, including the um, Office of Strategic Services, which was the precursor to the CIA and the CIA itself, um, you know, they encouraged their puppets, their lackeys, who were leading this uh, euro-federalist movement, this movement to kind of surrender sovereignty and self-government and uh, and impose this regional super state in its place. Um, you know, they said early on that they wanted this single currency. I mean, we have, for example, one of the declassified CIA memos from 1965 uh, addressed to the vice president of the so-called European community, right? That's what it was before it was the union. It was the community. Um, and the CIA tells him that he, um, he needs to impose a single currency and... Um, they need to do it quietly until the adoption of such proposals becomes almost inescapable, is, is the words they used in the memo. So, you know, that was the plan all along. People who said that that's what they were doing were dismissed as conspiracy theorists and whatnot. But, you know, now we have the declassified memos. Now we know for certain that actually they were just lying. And, uh, of course, that continues today. They continue to lie to us like it's nothing. And, uh, you know, 20 years from now, everybody will know, but nobody will think of it as lies, right? It'll just be, oh, that's how it always has been all along unless the American people wake up and put a stop to it. Well, and as far as the United States is concerned, now there are stories coming out regarding Brexit, regarding the British leaving and exiting the European Union. Uh, And you can look at the sources, BBC, CNN, Newsweek, Time, um, The Economist, The Telegraph, how this could really hurt the United States. Will Brexit, or how seriously will Brexit hurt the U.S., and they will also be damaged if Great Britain. So it, their, the tentacles of their fear-monger campaign are now extending to the shores of the U.S. Yeah, and, and really it's quite ridiculous. I mean, every one of these scenarios that they're concocting of doom and gloom uh, for Britain and for the United States and for anybody else, uh, it's really just pathetic fear-mongering. It's fear-mongering by an establishment that is determined and desperate to keep the British people uh, imprisoned in this European Union system. And, and I think prison is really the right word here. I, that people get the impression that this European Union is just a free trade agreement so the countries can trade freely and not go to war. You know, it's nothing of the sort. I mean, more than 75 percent of the laws now that govern Europeans come out of Brussels. And, you know, for people who aren't aware, the way uh, laws are made in Brussels is much different than, say, they're made in uh, you know, 
Washington, D.C., which is already pretty disgusting, but in national parliaments, where at least you have elected representatives working on legislation and then uh, you know getting it approved that way. The way it works in the European Union is you have this uh, executive arm, this massive bureaucracy with tens of thousands of little bureaucrats burrowing away in there, and uh, they come up with these laws. And uh, you know, just like it, they did in the Soviet Union, just like they do in communist China today, after they've decided what they want the law to be, they send it over to this fake parliament in Europe. They call it the European Parliament. And, uh, you know, parliament sounds nice, but really it's just a rubber stamp type body that approves the laws that were already created by the European Commission. So that would be like, you know, Obama writing laws and Congress just serving as a rubber stamp saying, okay, we agree with this law. So 75% of the laws that govern the people of Britain and, and the rest of the European Union come through this process, through this unaccountable process, right? If you don't like what these maniacs are doing, tough. You know, what are you going to do? You can't vote out the bureaucrats. You can't get rid of the European Commission, but they're going to decide your fate. And so, you know, the the British people have, of course, uh, you know, thousand years of traditions of liberty. I mean, it, it's really the British traditions that helped the United States form itself as a free country, right? We got a lot of these ideas from the progress that Britain had made over the years. You know, they came up with a Magna Carta, this idea that, uh, you know, the king did not have unlimited powers, and the people had certain rights that the king was obligated to respect. Um, you know, this all comes from Britain. So Britain has a very long and a very proud history of advancements in human liberty. And if they leave this European Union, well, you know, there's no telling what they might do. They might go back to maybe having a free market and maybe even having sound currency, maybe not. Uh, surrendering their sovereignty and going along with what the globalists call the New World Order. So, you know, I think they're desperate to keep them in. And again, we talked about the kind of domino effect it might have, right? Well, if Britain can leave, why can't Greece leave? Why can't Ireland leave? Why can't Spain and France? And, uh, you know, it, it really could, because people don't like the European Union. You know, if you look at the polls, the European Union has no public legitimacy. Uh, the, the few times where they've actually asked people to vote on these things, you know, uh, the Constitution comes to mind. I was in France at the time. Uh, you know, there was no support for this, none whatsoever. Every poster you would see on the streets, every protester you would see on the streets was opposed to this European constitution. So the Dutch voted and the French voted. They voted overwhelmingly against the European Union constitution. And so what does Brussels do? Well, they rename the constitution the Lisbon Treaty, and then they jam it down their throats anyways, even though it had already been rejected. And the Lisbon Treaty was like 98 percent exactly the same as the constitution that had been voted down. Or when Ireland refused to sign up for these things, they voted no. They said, well, you have to vote again. And they had to keep voting again and again until finally they got them to approve it. So it's, you know, it's a giant farce. This has no public legitimacy. And if the British leave, other people might get the idea to do the same. And the whole entire apparatus might come crumbling down. And remember, the European Union is crucial to the agenda. The European Union is the model for what's being pursued everywhere else. You know, you have Vladimir Putin building the Eurasian Union. You have uh, Communist China and the European Union imposing what they call the African Union on the Africans. Uh, the Council on Foreign Relations is openly, you know, they write articles saying we need a Middle Eastern Union. They want to impose a Middle Eastern Union on the Middle East. And, of course, they're working on similar things here in the United States, right? They uh, sought for a long time a North American Union. Uh, now they're working at the same time on the Trans-Pacific Partnership to create a Pacific Union that would ensnare the United States and the Transatlantic Union, the TTIP that we talked about earlier. So these globalists don't give up. And if Britain, you know, puts its foot down and says we're not going to go with this, it really could start a chain reaction that could severely disrupt uh, the globalist plans for really the entire world, not just Britain, not just the United States. You know, I think you're sounding a little bit conspiratorial, uh, Alex. No, I'm just kidding. Um. Right, but I mean, it, it, it is actually a, a good term to describe this. Um, you know, conspiracy, the word itself, I think a lot of people don't even realize what it means, right? They hear the, the media ridicule the term conspiracy, and a lot of times these reporters don't even know what they're talking about. But go to any dictionary, open, open it up to conspiracy, and what you'll find is actually a legal term. It's, you know, two or more people uh, working in secret on something that is either evil or immoral or illegal. So, you know, the government charges people with conspiracy all the time. There are innumerable conspiracies out in the world. Uh, history has been strongly guided and shaped and influenced by conspiracies. And anybody who denies that is really either just a, a total ignoramus or they're trying to deceive you. So, you know, it's that simple. Alex, um, 
We've got a couple of, of callers that have some questions. Uh, and just a real quick sidebar here. Turkey this morning th uh, threatened to unleash m millions of more refugees into Europe if they are not paid uh, billions of pounds uh, of uh, money, another three billion pounds of euro. Uh, well, another th three billion euros. I think it's euros. I, I, I don't. Yeah, it is euros. They just keep having these demands over and over and over again. Erdogan continues to line his pockets. He said he needs the money to take care of these refugees. Uh, have that in the back of your mind when we come back. Story just broke. Uh, go ahead, Yvonne. You're on the phone, the the uh, radio this morning, and then we'll get to the other callers. Uh, good morning. Good morning, Alex. You good mentioned morning, Alex. about that the CIA. It's the main factor of uh, deforming Europe, bringing to the European Union. Right. If you go back, the perestroika was nothing but joint operation between the KGB and CIA. And if you remember, the head of the state that become of both country, the United States and America, both one was the head of the KGB, the other one was the head of the CIA. Is that kind of connected with what you're talking about? Absolutely. Anyway. You know, you're hitting on another hugely important topic, and that's the fact that... Uh, a lot of the so-called implosion, the ostensible collapse of the Soviet Union, was actually a farce. And, uh, you know, people had been warning about this even before it happened. Uh, there's a, a, a defector from the KGB. He was in the KGB disinformation department. I highly encourage people who are interested to get his book. Uh, his name is Antonelli Golitschen, and uh, he wrote two books, The Perestroika Deception and uh, New Lies for Old. And what he argued, and he published these books in the early 80s, actually it was basically a summary of what he had told the CIA when he defected. He said, hey, I know that in Moscow at the KGB, right now they're working on long-range deception plans. And one of those deception plans is to uh, liberalize the governments in Eastern Europe so that it looks like communism is coming down and they're moving towards so-called democracy. And then we'll the Soviet Union. Uh, and, you know, basically we'll pretend communism has died and yet we'll all stay in power you know we'll we'll keep we'll control of everything and then uh, at a later point we'll come back and continue and finish with our plans for world domination so that is absolutely extremely well documented Golitschen is probably the most important defector to ever come out of the KGB in terms of the explosive information he realized and i don't i, I don't think he even understood the full picture right he he saw it from the view of somebody working within uh, you know, the bureaucracy of the KGB in Moscow. So he saw the communist conspiracy as kind of an end-all and be-all conspiracy, not realizing that there were forces even more powerful than that uh, at work here. So well, but, not mean, only, the information he revealed is huge. Not only that, he, he revealed it to the CIA that, were, that was part of the plan uh, overall anyway, and finally he had to come out with his books before the information actually got out to the public. Yeah, yep. that very important. And he was books. right. You know, he published this stuff in the early '80s, and uh, all of it happened just exactly the way he said it was going to happen. So, you know, I, I think he made uh, what was it, 190 something predictions, and uh, by the year, what was it, 2012 or whatever it was, uh, all but four or five of them had come true. So he was right on the money. He knew exactly what he was talking about, and he was right. You know, history and and subsequent events have confirmed the accuracy of what he was telling us. So, yeah, it's another huge issue that doesn't get the attention it deserves. And, uh, you know, I think it's very intricately related to what we're seeing right now with Moscow and the Eurasian Union and, of course, Beijing, which is playing uh, a larger and larger role in the kind of architecture of global governance, another topic that I've written on pretty extensively. Uh, uh, Alex, thanks, I, Alex. I uh, go ahead, uh, Yvonne. Did you have another question? Yeah, I have one other connection to make. In the famous letter uh, of Baruch Levi to Karl Marx, he said, by the revolution, by the insurgents, by victory of the proletariat, one day the Jew not going to need the Messiah. We're going to be our own Messiah. We're going to maintain the wealth of the world regardless of borders. Everything. So, how how do you disconnect? How, how do we connect with today's events now? That, that what's happening? Do, do you think that besides the evil British Empire, KGB and the CIA, that 
do you think that the the the, the, the master of the money did you have something to do with all this abolition of borders? No, I don't think so. Actually, and we discussed this. I think uh, the last time you called in, I, I really think well, it's a distraction. Well, I'm going to mention something Jewish else. I know, I understand that. But let me ask you a question: Before September 11, is, is it a coincidence that the European nation was condemning uh, Israel was going to put it on the list of the upper tribe nation? Uh, is it a coincidence that that, that September 11 uh, happened two weeks after? Oh, I, I don't know if it's a coincidence or not, and I know I wouldn't trust the most out of Israeli, far as I could throw them, And is Israeli but, Mossad, another question, yeah, Israeli Mossad has yeah. to do something with the, with the September 11, or it's only the Saudi Arabia, and I'll leave you with that. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you know, I, I, don't, I don't actually claim to know what happened on uh, September 11th, and uh, as I mentioned, I, I wouldn't trust the Mossad any more than I would trust any other intelligence agency, including the CIA, including the Saudi intelligence and, as a you know the Chinese intelligence, I, I think intelligence agencies generally um, have hidden agendas. They have nefarious elements within them, and that's not to say that everybody in the Mossad or everybody in the CIA. July thirteenth, two thousand sixteen. The next line in the sand. Join Paul Jensen on Inside the News, May sixteenth, as he sits down with Attorney Garrett Smith and Attorney Glenn Wagstaff in studio to discuss the upcoming changes to gun trusts and how it will affect you. But more importantly, what you can do about it. Get Inside the News like you don't get anywhere else with Paul Jensen, May sixteenth at eight a.m. Gun Trusts, what you need to know before the deadline, only on KTALK AM 630. I just met with my CPA, and I'm pretty ticked off. He told me that I owe the Obamacare penalty of over $2,000 to the IRS on top of all my other taxes because I didn't have a qualified health plan last year. Andy tells me that the penalty is going to be even higher this year. Luckily, I'm not going to have to deal with that anymore. I decided to opt out of the whole Affordable Care Act, including the IRS penalties. How is that possible? I just heard about a medical cost-sharing organization, and as a member, I'm exempt to the ACA individual mandate and the IRS penalties. I do get to keep my doctor because there are no networks, no HMOs, no PPOs, I can go wherever I like. Best of all, I'm paying a lot less than I was for health care. You should check it out, too. All the information you need is at medicalcostshare.com. If it makes sense, you can even enroll online. It's so easy. Once again, medicalcostshare.com. I promise you'll be glad you did. Medicalcostshare.com. It's not health insurance. It's better. This is How Fast the All New 2016 Chevrolet Malibu Hybrid uses gas. Use gas a whole lot slower in the all-new 2016 Chevrolet Malibu Hybrid, offering an estimated 48 MPG city. Official EPA estimates not yet available. Fuel economy estimate based on GM testing. Malibu Hybrid available spring 2016. While most video surveillance solutions capture and store hours of nothing, CUDA Eye by Barracuda Networks only captures video when something happens. Once Welcome captured back. on camera, I the don't video know what evidence is immediately encrypted there, and sent to the cloud just, uh, for safe storage and easy itself. retrieval from any uh, web browser back, or uh, mobile device. With CUDA Eye, Alex, there's no network here. configuration morning, or software Newman, to install. Uh, just plug one or more cameras into your network magazine, to better protect your morning. business. Don't get caught with uh, nothing. Do something we about it. Check out CUDAEye.com. That's C-U-D-A-E-Y-E.com. Back uh, with our callers. If you don't mind taking a uh, call from Michael, he's held over the break. Go ahead, Michael. Your question, comment for Alex Newman. Yes, uh, I'm still hearing that. Are you there? Uh, let me uh, put this straight, all right? Uh, with my postulate, do you really expect, Alex, to make it to November and see an election? This isn't doom and gloom. I mean, it might seem like doom, but there's no gloom in it for me. Alex, your your comment. Yeah, I, I, I actually missed the first part of the uh, question. Yeah, you know, I, um, something happened there. It didn't, didn't actually come up. Michael, can you start over with your that, question? That, that ad stopped finally. Uh, yes, yeah, I don't know what's uh, going on with it. it uh, something happened with, uh, with our feed. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Kissinger's at work there, huh? Trying to confuse the whole system. Yeah, we have uh, we have some squirrels down in the works. Go ahead, <laughs> start your question over again. Yes, I just had one question. 
Alex? Hello? Yeah, he's here. here. Alex? Yes, sir. Do you really expect to make it to November and see an election with what I have postulated? Do you know what, what a postulate is? Yep. Mm -hmm. What have you postulated? You have to tell us. What have you postulated, Michael? I've postulated that uh, we're not going to make it to uh, an election th this year or any year after this. That the well, Statue of Liberty will be the great harlot of Babylon uh, in remembrance to this whole thing. Okay, you're calling you know, Does that mean anything to you? Yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I hear a lot of people speculating that we might not have an election this year, that Obama might uh, try to stay in power, that they might just all out declare martial law. Uh, you know, I, I don't say it's outside of the realm of possibility. I, you know, of course, things like that could happen. But in my, you know, research on this and studying this over many, many years now, it, it seems to me that the globalists are quite patient and they prefer to do things very slowly because when they push too quickly on something like that, it really risks throwing a monkey wrench into their plans. And of course, you know, you could say that, well, a lot of people are waking up right now, and that's true. Uh, you could say that, uh, you know, in, in Europe, a lot of people are waking up, and that's true, too. So I, I don't think it's out of the question that we could have, you know, some sort of orchestrated major crisis. But at the same time, I think the globalists have shown over the years, over the decades, that they're quite patient, and they prefer to do things rather slowly because it works out better for them. It, you know, it gives people time to get used to each new change before they push the next huge new change on them. And you know, if they do it all too quickly, they risk, I think, setting off a critical mass of people waking up and saying, no, we're not going to do this. You know, they, they risk things like uh, having the military turn on them, you know, things like that just that are very dramatic. And at that point, you know, they would be in quite some trouble. So, again, I don't say it's outside of the realm of possibility, but I don't expect it. I, you know, I expect that things will continue uh, relatively as they are now uh, up through the 2016 election. I expect we'll have a 2016 election. And, um, you know, and, and I think it's good to, to keep that in mind. You know, even the Bible tells us that, you know, we should keep working. And, you know, even if we think the end is near, you know, don't quit your job. Don't, uh, you know, go out and stop doing stuff. So I think it's good to just, uh, you know, assume that things will keep going and, and uh take it from there and do what we can, you know, to, to raise awareness about these issues, to educate ourselves and to educate others and to organize. Because, you know, I'm, I'm still uh, cautiously optimistic that we can actually um, set this straight, but there's no shortcuts. You know, it, it, it requires action from everybody and getting educated and educating others, and I don't see any other way around it other than doing that. So, Well, a couple of our uh, guests here on the air, specialists ab about uh, have a, an opinion about these things, an educated opinion. Uh, number one, don't believe that they'll do, make a major push against the Americans uh, until they first, first disarm them. Uh, and the other is that uh, they don't want to have this blamed on the current uh, administration that they've supported so much. They'd wait until after the elections and, and Obama, Obama being out of office before they start making the, the globalist push. They are in charge. They do have the power. They can control the money. They can control the uh, – uh, in, in the IMF, they can control uh, uh, the Treasury, un unfortunately, and politicians. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think that they would be – it would be unwise for them to make their, their big final push at a time when uh, they may not win that, that race or that prize. And maybe they've got war in mind in the future before that happens as well. What do you think? I, I think that's a very real possibility, and you know they've understood for for a long time now that war is an excellent tool for pushing uh, populations into things that they never would have imagined before, that they never would have imagined possible. And uh, you know, globalists have been talking about this for more than a hundred years. We have a State Department document from 1968 uh, written by uh, a gentleman, Blumenfield, uh, and he explains that the document was called um, "A World Effectively Controlled by the United Nations," and basically he was speculating, he was trying to theorize how you could most quickly bring about a world effectively controlled by the United Nations. And this is an official document; anybody can go find it. And in there, he says that war, or the threat of war at least, is uh, perhaps the most effective means of uh, of getting us in that direction. So, if we did see um, a war, it wouldn't surprise me. Uh, I certainly hope we won't. Um, 
but I don't think it's out of the question. You know, uh, you, you, you've seen uh, in just in the last year or two a lot of saber rattling between uh, the so-called Western globalists and then Putin and the Chinese. And so, you know, especially with what's going on in Syria, you know, that could easily blow up and become a, kind of a global conflagration. You'd have uh, maybe Russia, China, Iran, and some of these on one side, European Union, United States on the other. And, uh, yeah, that could get really messy, really ugly, and, you know, people could be told afterwards, hey, you know, if you just agree to a global government, we won't have these kinds of things anymore. You won't have to send your sons and daughters off to go die in the war. You won't have your city bombed to smithereens. And a lot of people would say, okay, you know what, we'll just give us back some normalcy and we'll take it. And um, it's a big risk, so I think we should be on guard against that. Uh, the United States, I think, of course, needs to... Um, keep its military up and be prepared for war, because I think there are uh, forces out there that would destroy us if they could, and um, at some point may try to do that. But at the same time, I think we can't take our eye off you know, the man behind the curtain, so to speak. Okay, uh, very good. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Tony. By the way, th Michael, thank you for your call this morning. Really appreciate it. Good question. Go ahead, uh, Tony. Uh, Chris. Oh, I'm excuse me. I got the two mixed up. Chris, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, Mr. Newman, I appreciate the work you do for JBS. They're a good organization. I was a member at one time. Um, I've got a question. Assuming that uh, Donald Trump gets in as president, it looks very good for him at this point, uh, with the majority Republican Congress in both houses, do you think that the powers to be could not resist affecting a downturn in the economy? Not so that they can blame it on Trump or the Republicans per se, but to blame it on conservatism and traditional American values in general? Oh, I, I think that's totally possible, and I think we may see it. And In fact, I think uh, some economic problems, maybe even worse than problems, maybe problems is putting it too mildly, are already baked into the cake. Actually, I, I don't see any way around this now. <clears throat> um, you know, you have the, the Federal Reserve has been printing money like it's going out of style since, uh, well, you know, for 100 years now, but especially since the economic crisis in 2008. They're talking about negative interest rates. I mean, the economy is literally um, hanging on the edge of a cliff. And I think at any time it could fall over, and it would be uh, rather unpleasant for all of us. And I think the insiders, the globalists, could use their, uh, their media lackeys to blame it on whatever they wanted to. They could blame it on Trump. They could blame it on capitalism. They could blame it on the fact that we don't have enough regulations as if, uh, you know, that were – uh, legitimate concern, but I think it's it's entirely possible that we will see something like that, and I think it's certain that we're going to see some uh, economic problems, turbulence, uh, probably in the not too distant future. You know, to just look at what the Federal Reserve is doing. This negative interest rates thing is absolute lunacy, and they've told us for quite some time that they want a global currency. So the best way to achieve a global currency would be to have. Uh, very serious economic problems, maybe with the dollar, for example, maybe the dollar losing its status as the global reserve, and um, using that crisis, using that cash as an opportunity to say, hey, why don't we just move toward this, uh, you know, run currency? Which again, they've been pushing openly for quite some time. You know, the people like uh, Putin talking about a global currency. You've had the leader countries talking about this. You even had Obama's uh, tax-dodging Treasury Secretary saying, oh, yeah, we're quite open to this idea of an IMF global currency that the communist Chinese had been proposing. So, you know, at, at the upper levels of the globalist establishment, uh, this is what they're hoping for, and then occasionally the truth comes out, even occasionally in the mainstream media. So it's something we should be aware of. Of course, the real solution to the problem is not to have a global currency. It's to go back to having honest money rather than uh, you know, hoax fiat money based on debt printed by a private cartel of bankers. But, um, you yeah, know, that requires people becoming educated about how the money system works and maybe how it ought to work for us to be able to, to do that. Well, and having said that, uh, now they're coming out and there's a big push on, on uh, from every direction, other countries as well as within the United States, of, of creating a cashless society, as dangerous as that may be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, high on the agenda, too. You know, you have uh, the U.S. government is funding this. The United Nations is funding this. They're already doing some trial runs in some third-world countries. Sweden is very advanced on the road to a cashless society. They have very little cash now in Sweden, and the goal is to eventually take it totally cashless. 
And, uh, you know, they're using the same old stale arguments. Well, there won't be uh, as many robberies. And, well, you know, then people won't dodge taxes, and it'll be harder for drug dealers to operate. Okay, yeah, and what about your freedom? What about your privacy rights? What happens if your government turns totalitarian? What happens if there's a problem with the computer system? What happens if the electricity goes out? People are not thinking through this. This is an extremely dangerous proposition. It would allow the government to track every move you make. And, uh, I mean, frankly, that's terrifying. That's absolute craziness. But, uh, you know, those aren't the things that they talk about in the media. They just talk about all these alleged uh, benefits from it. And I think that is something that we need to be aware of and that we need to resist. We need to make sure that we have uh, cash and I mean, ultimately real money, right, or sound money. But, uh, I mean, the move to a cashless society is a huge topic. It should be explored and it should be resisted. Anything else, Chris? Real quickly, you've got to. Yeah, I just of... yeah. For that reason, I'll be brief. Um, for that reason, I think the powers that be may even want a, a Donald Trump in the presidency rather than Hillary Clinton, because I don't think that they can, even if they wanted to, I don't think they can hold back this tide of debt and derivatives and the economic perils that we've uh, put ourselves in. So I think they want a conservative and an overtly one at uh, that. Good. So, good thank call. you, guys. Very, very good call. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Fred, real quick, we're, only, we're down to a minute and a half. Okay, I'll, I'll make it fast. Uh, I've got a news nugget. Uh, uh, because of the groundswell that we've had, uh, late, well, not lately, for a long time, about the separation of church and state, I hope I got the figures correct. How can our uh, people who hold the purse, namely Congress, permit Obama to send around $800 million overseas to restore mosques? That's a good question. And, you know, we see that all the time. Really what they mean when they say separation of church and state is Christians should not open their mouths. Christians should not be in government. Christians should not uh, use the, the laws of God as their yardstick. Uh, and everything else is fine, right? And and we see this consistently, whether we, it's the, you know, preaching of the humanist religion in the schools or the, you know, funding the construction of mosques with American tax dollars or, uh, you know, funding this global warming hoax that the actual head of the global warming hoax, the head of the U.N. IPCC, which is the U.N.'s pseudo-scientific global warming body, he admitted that this was all his religion. He said so in his resignation letter, and yet Congress and the Obama administration are sending billions of dollars to prop up this dangerous false religion. So what they really mean is just anti-Christian bigotry. They don't really mean separation of church and state. They just mean Christians should be quiet and... and uh, submit to what's going on here and all under, other under religions. what you know, budget that, alex do does uh, obama spend 770 million dollars of taxpayer united states american hard-working taxpayer dollars over to uh well i guess under the guise of uh, refurbishing these mosques but who there's no oversight on how the money is spent when it get to gets to these mosques is this just another mask of uh supporting his agenda, like he has ISIS and, and Al-Qaeda and, and these other organizations. Where's our representation of our Congress who hold the purse strings? It's an outrage. Anyway, you, you I'll bet. That's on. a great, that's yeah. r exactly right. Uh, we've yeah, only got about uh, 30 really seconds, Alex. Uh, yeah, I think the caller hit the nail on the head. Congress should not escape responsibility here. Yeah, Obama's doing all kinds of stuff he should not be doing. He's violating the Constitution. He's violating our rights. He's uh, making a mockery of his office. But Congress is enabling him. They're giving him the money. They're signing the checks that are allowing him to do all this stuff, whether it's you know the mosque construction or the global warming money. They've enabled this at every step of the way, and they should not be doing that. Boy, a great, great show this morning, Alex. See you next week. Alan Blood with Capital Financial Group. With home values increasing and low rates still available, now is the perfect time to refinance your home. Capital Financial Group, we have loan programs to fit your refinance needs, whether you want to pull cash out from your home, decrease your interest rate and monthly payment, or just reduce your loan to a 15-year payoff. We have programs that will help you refinance even if your income or credit is less than it used to be or if you're underwater on your mortgage. Instead of getting lost in the shuffle of a big bank or paying high fees at a credit union, call us and we'll help you refinance with the best rates and lowest closing costs for you. You may even qualify for one of our no-closing-cost loans. Call me today, Alan Blood, at 801-298-5887 to start saving money on your mortgage now. 801-298-5887, NMLS number 3146. Growth can be an intimidating six-letter word, especially when the guys upstairs want 7% of it. That's why you need one eight-letter word, G-R-A-I-N-G-E-R, Granger. The G is for growth, from industry specialists to over a million products across almost...